Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jill O'Donnell. I am the director of the Yider Institute here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar on US-UK trade negotiations is the third in our series on the theme of measuring and managing risk and uncertainty in international trade. There will be three more webinars following this one between now and October 9th. All session details, including video recordings of our previous sessions, are available on our website. I'd like to thank the Chicago Mercantile Group Exchange Foundation, or CME Group, for its support of this webinar series, which the Yider Institute hosts every other year in honor of Clayton Yider, who served as president and CEO of the CME from 1978 to 1985. Before we start, I'd like to highlight a few people in the audience to give everyone a sense of who is joining us today, even though you can't see their faces. So welcome to Veronica Haggart, a former commissioner on the US International Trade Commission and Yider Institute Advisory Council member, Christy Block with the Nebraska Grain and Feed Association, and Nick Streff, Regional Director of USDA NAS here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Welcome to them and to all of you. As a reminder to all attendees, your audio is muted, your video is off, but we are eager to engage you with your questions. Please use the Q&A function in Zoom to submit your questions for our speakers. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website afterwards. And now I'm pleased to kick off this series today, this session today, by welcoming our speakers, Dr. Lauren Bartles is a reader in international law in the Faculty of Law and a fellow of Trinity Hall at the University of Cambridge, where he teaches trade law. Dr. Kyle Handley is a professor of business economics and public policy at the University of Michigan and a faculty research fellow in the National Bureau of Economic Research. He studies international trade, investment, uncertainty, and firm employment dynamics. And our moderator, moderator today will be Warren Marurama. Warren is a partner at Hogan Lovells whose practice focuses on US and international trade law, negotiations, policies, and disputes. Warren previously served as general counsel of the Office of the US Trade Representative, as well as in positions in the White House and the US International Trade Commission. He also serves on the Yeider Institute Advisory Council. With that, I will turn it over to Warren. So um, thanks, uh, Jill, for the introductions. Uh, thanks to all of you out there in the audience uh, for joining the, us today. I hope this uh, finds everyone um, safe and well. Our uh, program today focuses on the negotiations over a US free trade agreement with Great Britain. Um, this is something that's uh, moving along very quickly. The formal launch of the negotiations came in May. Um, there's been a lot of uh, input and support from um, President Trump and from uh, Prime Minister Johnson. The negotiators uh, just completed their fourth round of negotiations. And uh, this is a more complicated exercise because what they're talking about is a comprehensive free trade agreement, like the US-Mexico-Canada agreement or USMCA. And so it would cover a broad range of issues covering industrial and agricultural tariffs, services, investment, intellectual property, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, uh, restrictions on uh, imports of farm products uh, for health or um, plant, animal, or human health reasons, standards barriers, a whole host of things. But uh, they've made uh, good progress. What we hear from um, our friends in USTR is that this is moving along at a very good pace and particularly compared to past US free trade agreements where the negotiations have often taken years. But um, a friend of mine and colleague from USTR um, once uh, noted that uh, free trade agreements are easy to start but they're hard to finish and this negotiation is just getting to the hard stage. So uh, Jill's program is uh, very timely. And one of the challenges out there is that the US has a short window. Under our constitution and our uh, trade laws, US free trade agreements require congressional approval. And it's pretty much taken as a given that any congressional approval has to go up through the Trade Promotion Authority or fast track process, which requires an up or down vote and prevents uh, delays or filibusters in our Senate. 
USTR is currently operating under negotiating or TPA authority from the 2015 Bipartisan Trade Act. That authority runs out on July 1, 2021. So they've got uh, maybe about eight, nine months to wrap this thing up. The effective uh, date where it has to be wrapped up is somewhat earlier because certain notifications have to start going up to Congress about the content of the deal as early as April of 2021. And the situation is equally complex on the UK side, since the UK negotiators have the unenviable challenge of trying to negotiate simultaneously uh, with the US and EU, because uh, part of uh, what's going on right now is the negotiations with the European Commission, a uh, formidable and very experienced set of negotiators over a post-Brexit economic arrangement. And the EU accounts for, I think, roughly 40% of UK exports, the US for only 10%. So this is a situation where the UK is trying to triangulate and uh, in some senses, it faces very conflicting demands from the US and the EU. But in other senses, a deal is eminently feasible of the uh, pending FTAs that have been launched by the Trump administration. This one probably has the best chances of getting to the finish line. The US and the UK are longstanding allies. They have a special relationship and uh, on the trade side, uh, most U.S. industrial goods, services, investors don't face serious tariff or non-tariff barriers. Uh, and as USTR uh, negotiators have said, uh, the U.S. and U.K. systems are closely aligned on some of the key and most sensitive chapters like intellectual property, services, investment, and financial services. Uh, the biggest challenges, as I think we're going to develop in the course of um, our uh, speakers, are likely to be agriculture and to a much lesser extent, autos and the auto rules of origin. So, uh, Lauren, I'll start with you. What do you see as the biggest challenges uh, for the UK in completing a free trade agreement with the United States? Um, yeah, well, thanks, Warren. Uh, and uh, also, hello to everybody. Um, I would say that there are, you can break this down to three baskets. Probably the second and third will come on to uh, during the course of the seminar. And those three baskets are logistical, uh, sequencing, and also the substance of what the UK hopes to get out of an FTA with the US. Um, Mainly what I want to just say now is something about the uh, logistics of it from the UK side. And Warren, you mentioned that one of the complexities is that the UK is simultaneously negotiating with the EU and with the US. But actually, uh, just in numerical terms, that's a small part of it because the UK is also at the moment negotiating uh, concretely with Australia and with New Zealand. Um, it has a mandate to negotiate access to CPTPP. Um, it's got continuity agreements still being negotiated with a range of other countries, uh, including Canada. So it's really, um, you know, fighting wars, if that's the right metaphor, uh, in, uh, on, a, on you know, a large number of fronts. And that's something that I don't think any country has really done before. Um, now, the UK negotiators also haven't done this before. They've had some experience because they've been at this for a little while now. But, you know, everybody is still, uh, you know, coming to this pretty much afresh. It's learning on the job. Um, there was a lot of training that was done of negotiators. But, you know, there isn't, let's say, a, a deep wellspring of experience um, in negotiations, which is, uh, you know, reasonably unique um, when it comes to, uh, well, countries in the world. It's just a feature of European Union having done all of this for the last 40 years with not all that much member state input, or at least very selective member state input. So that's the first, I think, big challenge for the UK. Secondly, uh, we'll come on to this uh, sequencing uh, with the EU. And, uh, and then the third issue is also, you know, concretely what the UK is looking for. So Kyle... Um, now I'm going to flip it over to you. What do you see as the challenges for the United States? Uh, thanks, Warren. And uh, also, hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I, 
I think the biggest challenges uh, for the United States are just going to be trying to get this thing done before the Trade Promotion Authority runs out. Uh, I think you've made some good points about how they've they've been humming along uh, faster than usual. Um, but with the election coming up uh, and knowing that most of these agreements tend to take you know years uh, to, to set up uh, and get done, I, I'm not particularly optimistic they'll be able to get this through through Congress um, even if they get it signed. But that's not necessarily the end because oftentimes I think the Trade Promotion Authority expires before the trade promotion authority uh, expires before um, they finish the deal or before it goes to Congress. And so uh, other free trade agreements, for example, with uh, Colombia and uh, Korea, both sort of were signed, but then never voted on in Congress uh, for a number of years. Um, and then actually even more recently where the, the Korea uh, agreement was renegotiated uh, to some degree by the Trump administration after the fact. And so um, I, I think the challenges are probably just going to be that uh, there's, there's a lot to work out. Uh, these are two developed countries with, um, you know, high income developed countries with modern economies. The United States hasn't negotiated uh, an agreement uh, like that other than the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which uh, Trump has pulled us out of. Uh, and so I think, um, I think it will take some time for them to kind of work out, you know, all the terms of the deal. I mean, and ultimately with these things, the goal is, is free trade in, in goods and services. Uh, but what, what they'll end up spending a lot of time on, and you mentioned this in your introduction, Warren, is they, they have to work out the rules of origin, particularly on, uh, on autos, uh, which was one of the things that was a big sticking point with the USMCA deal. Um, and then they'll also have to work out a timeline for how quickly uh, or slowly, as the case may be, the tariffs actually come down. Um, and th those things, I think, require a lot of back and forth with the industry lobbyists that we, we know are heavily involved in these things. So, Lauren, um, I'd like to focus in on one of the sensitivities. Um, one of the big winners in most U.S. free trade agreement, quite often the biggest winner by far, is U.S. agriculture. Since we're a major exporter of uh, grains, fruits and vegetables, beef, pork, chicken, um, nuts and fruits, we have a very broad range of um, agricultural exports, although we also have uh, some uh, agricultural constituencies that want protection. Um, one of the big challenges here is that uh, since the EU, the UK has been part of the EU for the last um, 40 years or so, um, it has adhered to the EU's sanitary, phytosanitary regime, which uh, effectively locks out um, a lot of uh, GMO US crops, uh, hormone-treated beef, chlorine-treated chicken, ractopamine-treated uh, pork, and uh, dairy products uh, that have been treated with BST. Um, and this uh, is gonna be, I would say, probably one of the chief aims of the US negotiators. Uh, how do you see this coming out? And do you think the UK uh, can really open up its market to um, US farm products? Well, you're right. It's certainly a hot button issue. I mean, every trade negotiation, as I'm sure you've experienced many times, uh, tends to resolve for the public in a number of uh, hot button issues, which can vary from country to country. I mean, I'd say the two that have broadened out momentarily for the UK are protecting the National Health Service, which is uh, iconic in the UK. I should say I'm not British, so I didn't grow up with that, so I don't have quite the same emotional attachment to it as uh, uh, people in this country have. I'm Australian. Um, but for the British, the National Health Service is sacrosanct. So that's one issue, um, which is, you know, every government here says it's not on the table. But the second is food. And um, this is interesting, culturally speaking, because 
um, food uh, standards are a big EU thing, right? But it tends to be driven by other countries. Uh, the Italians, um, the French, uh, the Germans to some extent with GMOs in particular, the Spanish. Uh, the British have never been, um, you know, particularly strong when it comes to food standards in a, you know, everything has to be organic kind of way. Where the British are culturally very uh, strong is on animal welfare. And so that's really becoming a crunch point in this country. So, um, for instance, you don't see so much um, agitation in the UK at the moment when it comes to hormone beef or GMOs. I mean, there's obviously a bit of a vocal minority saying that that's no good. But where uh, the, uh, you know, the headlines have focused, where what gets people um, you know, riled up is on animal welfare and the totemic product that that is focused on is uh, chlorine washed chicken, or as we like to call it, um, chlorine chicken. Um, so uh, that is, um, you know, as you also saw with TTIP, um, once the public gets hold of a particular issue, um, it can sometimes become a bit detached from reality. It just becomes, uh, you know, something that needs to be ring fenced. The question I guess you're asking me is, have we got that, um, you know, at this stage? And I would say, uh, well, obviously, it's very hard to say, right? I mean, you don't know. Uh, so whatever I say is speculative. But I would say it's close to that. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, there can't be some movement on some of the agricultural issues. One interesting feature of all of this is the WTO legality of some of these barriers. Now, in particular, two that you mentioned, GMOs and um, hormone-fed beef, we know, are illegal under WTO law. And at the moment, the EU is putting up with retaliation from the US and uh, Canada um, on, um, on these issues. So, you know, that complicates the situation a little bit because the UK, um, it's fine to say, well, we want to adhere to existing standards, which it is now in the process of legislating actually in, um, uh, in Parliament. Um, there's a bill going through, the Agriculture Bill, which uh, is being amended, uh, just been amended actually in the House of Lords, you know, the upper house here, uh, to say that in no trade agreement can animal welfare standards be lowered. Now, that is a chicken issue because the chickens are, the chlorine chicken is seen as an animal welfare issue. Um, it doesn't apply so much to the, to the cows or, or to the GMOs, obviously. So, um, you know, the difficulty is you can say that and say, well, we're going to adhere to domestic standards uh, and so on. Um, but the problem is that those domestic standards in at least two of those cases we know are illegal. So that complicates things a little bit. So on the one hand, you've got, um, you know, you've got the animal welfare issue, which is the chickens. And I think that is very strongly, uh, very strongly held protective defensive interest here and probably close to being untouchable. Um, in the absence, of course, of the WTO case brought by the Americans. And I'm not quite sure why the exist, maybe you can shed some light on this. Why did that case, uh, which was, what, a decade ago or so, there was a case on the EU's chlorine chicken ban. Why was that dropped? Um, I've never managed to work this one out. Um, but, you know, from an offensive US point of view, might be time to think about that again. Um, but, you know, there's that. And then you've got the other two um, uh, the other two issues where there seems to be a little bit less, um, you know, fixation, but that can come back. At the moment, it's just, you know, maybe, maybe it's just the public like to have one thing at a time. Uh, and maybe we'll, we'll hear more about beef hormone um, but, uh, and GMOs. But at the moment, it's the chlorine chickens, and I think that's close to being uh, a, a real sticking point. Well, I guess that's good news for um, Og and... Um, cattle farmers, but bad news for all the uh, chicken farms along the um, Delaware, North Carolina, and um, Maryland coast. Um, just a, a couple of things. Uh, first, I think the uh, U.S. going after the National Health Service is a bit of a red herring because uh, we exempt Medicare and Medicaid and VA medical programs from our FTAs, and that's a sacred, equally sacred exception on the U.S. side. So I think uh, if we take that one out of the equation, it 
really does come back again to agriculture. And I guess one question that's come up over here is why did uh, Prime Minister Johnson set up this Agricultural Trade Commission? And what do you expect to come out of it? And I think the worry here is whether it's going to be something that ties uh, the UK's hands. Yeah, so that was announced in about July, I think. Um, and it was in response to the chlorine chicken issue really hitting the front pages. Um, I think that in reality, the setting up of the commission is less important than what ends up in the uh, agriculture bill, which is, um, as I said before, being tossed around. In fact, it appears in the agriculture bill uh, as being set up. But if you look at what it says, it's, you know, must report on this and that. It's an advisory body. So what was it supposed to achieve? Well, it was supposed to um, comfort the public, to assure the public that uh, concerns about animal, I mean, a few other things about agriculture as well, but on this point, um, that animal welfare considerations would be taken uh, seriously in negotiations with the US. Now, in the uh, agriculture bill, it specifically talks about chapters of FTAs not lowering existing animal welfare standards. Um, that is, you know, pretty strong uh, and stronger than the, um, the, you know, equivalent provisions on the Agriculture Commission. They're actually not even connected. Um, so, that, you know, but that's what happens when legislation goes through. It's not, not everything is connected because it's done by way of amendment. Um, whether this will get through, I don't know. I mean, the Commons uh, is run, you know, in this country by the government and uh, that's the lower house, of course, everybody knows. And uh, if they really want to, they can just uh, override these amendments. So we'll see what happens. But it, it, it does signify uh, a strong public uh, concern. I see a question there. Do you mind if I answer one of the Q&A questions, which is um, how can chlorinated chicken possibly be considered a welfare issue? What is the basis? Can you provide one uh, more points? Well, uh, the answer to that is, um, and I should say, I don't know if this is true, right? This is just the way it's being presented. It's, an, it's seen as an animal welfare issue because the idea is that, I mean, I'll be describe this in a sort of shorthand, blunt way. Um, the idea is that in the US, you don't need to worry so much about how the chickens are kept um, in terms of, you know, how much of the bacteria they, uh, they, uh, they have on them because at the end of it, you just wash them, right? So you wash away the sins, essentially. And that is seen as an animal welfare issue here. So the European approach, which is the UK approach, because the UK is still bound by EU law until the end of the year, is a, a sort of more, uh, I think they call it farm to fork. So you look after the chickens more as they're alive, which means you don't have to worry too much about what you do with the carcasses uh, once they're dead, or at least you can treat them in a slightly less chemical way. That's, again, I'm not a farmer or a scientist, so I can't really say whether, uh, you know, that, that's all completely true, but that's certainly the, the way that this is presented. So, so hopefully that explains it. As opposed to, for instance, the idea being that if you eat one of the chlorine washed chickens that you, you get sick and die. That is apparently not so much um, the issue. Yeah, just from living in Maryland and going out to the um, Eastern shore, the Delmarva Peninsula a lot, um, you see these massive uh, chicken houses uh, in Delaware and uh, Maryland, and you know it's just industrial scale raising of chickens. So maybe that's what the animal welfare people are worked up about. But Kyle, um, I'd like to turn back to you since you're a specialist in negotiating uncertainty, um, and there certainly are uncertainties in this and in every other trade negotiation. Um, so one of the biggest ones is we're in the middle of an election and uh, certainly looks uh, like it could be pretty close. People have different views on it, but what do you think is the impact of the election on the US negotiating positions? And do you think uh, things would change significantly if we were to see a, a Vice President Biden uh, getting elected on November 3rd, uh, apart from, you know, the turmoil, at least in the U.S. system, of virtually wholesale uh, changeover of senior personnel. Sure. Um, let me start by answering the question about uh, what's going to happen, you know, in a in a transition, you know, because we have this election coming up. And 
I mean, I, I think this particular time period that we're in seems uh, very unique in a lot of ways, but uh, the United States, uh, just to use the United States as, as an example, we've crossed over presidencies and elections, you know, many, many times uh, with different trade agreements. So NAFTA was born uh, during the first uh, Bush administration, and it was finished uh, when Clinton was president. Uh, the Korea, Peru, and Colombia free trade agreements were also started during the Bush administration and finished during the Obama administration. Uh, and the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, not to use too many acronyms, was also started during the Bush administration. Uh, and much progress was made uh, during the Obama administration. And then, and then it was killed. So that's a counterpoint to what I've, I've been arguing. Uh, but the reason that it was killed was because it became uh, an election issue uh, for both uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump. Uh, that, you know, they, they both said they had problems with the TPP and that they were going to change it. Uh, and, and even just to give one more example, even when uh, Obama was running for president in 2008, uh, he said during campaign speeches that he was going to renegotiate NAFTA. Uh, and that, of course, made certain special interests, you know, very happy. Uh, it may have had some effect on, you know, how permanent people viewed uh, the commitments that were in NAFTA. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, he never followed through with that. It was just something he said he was going to do. Um, now, things are different, I think, in this, in, in this context, uh, because there's a trade war going on, you know, not only with China, but with uh, a number of other countries. It's, it's primarily focused on China, uh, but we still have, you know, very high steel and aluminum tariffs against uh, a number of different countries. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something that's gonna be part of the debate. I think that uh, an incoming Biden administration, uh, ju just as the Trump administration, I think is finding now, would have a very hard time unwinding uh, the trade war and sort of unwinding uh, some of the momentum that there is right now uh, toward you know, the U.S. being more protectionist, uh, favoring these bilateral deals over these bigger you know, multi-country deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the WTO. Um, but, and I, I do not have any inside information on this, I, I think that these trade agreements have two different purposes uh, for countries. So one, uh, they're, they're part of sort of promoting exports, uh, getting access to different markets, uh, potentially getting cheaper uh, consumer goods and, and uh, intermediate inputs for firms uh, through imports as well. But the other thing that they do is they are part of, you know, political economic uh, relationships and, you know, geopolitics. And I, I don't think this is controversial to say, the Trump administration has definitely soured relationships uh, around the world for the United States. And a Biden administration, you know, may be more open to certain concessions than a Trump administration uh, with the UK. I don't know that, uh, but there may be some reason to kind of get a deal done in part uh, to be on good terms with the UK. Uh, and maybe that could be the start of sort of mending some of these relationships uh, that have gone downhill over the past four years. Um, but again, like I said, the, the anti-trade sentiment and making trade much more of a political and election issue than it's been for a long time uh, will be hard for Biden to unwind. And uh, I, I really don't know what the exit strategy is for the trade war. Um, but to some extent, it might be that uh, the Biden administration goes out and uh, works on some of these other bilateral deals, uh, including the UK. So I would expect, as I mentioned, you know, at the beginning of this, that it'll be hard to get this thing done uh, before trade promotion authority expires. But um, I think there's enough interest in the United States, uh, both politically and economically, that like want it, that I would anticipate that a Biden administration would be able to continue uh, and, you know, eventually close the deal. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think um, you've seen a lot of continuity, uh, certainly on China policy, where um, both Trump and Biden are competing with each other to show that they would be tougher on China. Um, but at the same time, I think one of Biden's main criticisms of Trump has been um, 
the treatment of our allies, including, I think, prominently the Section 232 tariffs on other countries, which have prevented um, uh, efforts to form a multilateral or broader coalition on China. Yeah, absolutely. Concerns are broadly shared. So, Lauren, one of the peculiar challenges of this whole negotiation is uh, that the EU has, the UK has to triangulate between um, the US and the EU and some of their conflicting demands on things like uh, sanitary, phytosanitary measures, geographical indications, uh, subsidies, things like that. Um, and one of the things that uh, US officials have said is that uh, in some senses, uh, the UK is not in a position to make some of the harder decisions here until it's sorted things out with the EU. How is that affecting the UK's negotiating positions? And when do you think that there would be sufficient um, clarity on Brexit for them to really start uh, digging into an end game where uh, the hard issues get solved? Um, I actually think that, uh, you know, based on what the UK government has said publicly, you know, many times and very strongly recently, um, probably a good number of these issues are known already. So it's important to note that the, um, the UK government's, uh, negotiation position when it comes to the EU negotiations at the moment is that it wants maximum freedom. Uh, to regulate um, in any way that it sees fit. So uh, that applies to um, sanitary and phytosanitary standards. Um, that applies to regulation of data. Um, that applies, uh, you know, pretty much across the world. It applies, for instance, to subsidies, where the UK is at the moment telling me this is the major sticking point in those negotiations. The UK is uh, uh, at the moment not um, telling the EU uh, what its system will be for regulating subsidies, which is a big problem for the EU because they don't want a, a large neighbor undercutting the EU and the EU has a strong um, subsidy control regime. So in that sense, what the UK is, um, you know, pushing for the EU is a, is a lot of freedom. It's that sort of freedom, which would um, mean that it has a free hand to negotiate uh, an FTA with the US. So I see the sequencing issue as being largely about uh, regulatory freedom. Um, now, whether the UK's position is going to be adhered to in negotiations, people can have different opinions on, but um, the government has been pretty consistent here uh, in, uh, in saying that it wants uh, a pretty thin deal with the EU when it comes to regulatory matters. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not offering much alignment. So I think that the sequencing issue probably isn't as big as it was once thought. Um, in terms of pure market access, I mean, that still is there. Uh, as an issue. I mean, if you're um, uh, the US negotiating on market access into the UK, um, it obviously makes a difference whether what you sell to the UK can, for instance, be incorporated in a UK product, which can then be sold onto the EU. And, you know, if so, imagine you're selling auto parts to an auto part to an auto manufacturer in the UK, and that those cars from the UK aren't being sold in the EU, well, that reduces the value, obviously, of any concessions you might gain on auto parts for the upstream product, the incorporated product. Um, I, you know, that, that's an issue for the US, really, more than for the UK. Um, so, you know, there is still a sequencing issue there. But from the UK side, I think it's more, you know, how much um, freedom from, uh, uh, from the EU regulatory system does it have? And I say at the moment, we can probably assume quite a bit one way or another. So um, what does the UK think it'll get out of a free trade agreement with the United States? And, a, you know, a, a broader question, I think, would be uh, politically and um, strategically, but also 
um, uh, trade negotiations generally come down to sort of uh, dollars and cents issues. And what are the big exports where the UK thinks it might gain greater access through a US uh, FTA? Um, I mean, this is not one of those countries where it's, um, you know, it's got a, a few limited export interests like Australia, for instance, you know, which uh, its exports are uh, you know, relatively limited uh, in, in terms of, you know, what's important, you know, you're talking about a few um, agricultural items. So the UK is a big manufacturing country, uh, you know, it's still uh, in the top 10 in the world. Um, uh, not quite sure where it is in the top 10, but, you know, happily floating around in the top 10. Um, and so it's, you know, it's not really, I think it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to focus on a few different products. If you look at the UK's, um, uh, you know, public uh, document setting out the case for a US FTA, um, it lists a huge number of products um, ranging from, you know, Scotch whiskey to ceramics to uh, machinery, road vehicles, service. I mean, it's basically everything. And the way they divide it up, as you would expect, is they pick on particular regions and they say, this is what an FTA can do for you. But essentially it's, uh, you know, I think the short answer is probably everything. But um, this is only part of the story. I mean, the US has relatively low tariffs, of course, higher tariffs when it comes to uh, agriculture and a few others. Um, I think ceramics is reasonably high, if I'm not mistaken. And then you have, of course, the special tariffs, um, which are, uh, you know, a specialty of, of this administration, like, um, uh, uh, but also case specific, like tariffs that apply because of the uh, EU's violation of WTO law in the Airbus case, which hit Scotch whiskey. So there are, you know, a variety of, um, uh, of tariffs in play, but on the whole, uh, you know, the average tariff is, of course, very low and the gain to be got out of that sort of market and the same with services, you know, the gains to be got are estimated on the UK side as being, you know, on uh, the assumption of a very good deal, you know, elimination of tariffs, most regulatory barriers and so on. I think it's 0.016% um, of UK GDP. Uh, sorry, did I say 0? I think it's point. 1.6%, sorry. Um, let's just put that in perspective, the hit to the UK of um, the uh, uh, coronavirus um, is, uh, let me see, I've actually got this up here, I can just find it in one sec, is um, relatively more. So just the virus itself takes you down to, um, uh, I think, 5%. Um, and uh, a no deal, no FTA deal Brexit with the EU takes you down uh, much more than that even. It's, uh, you know, down to uh, close to 10% of GDP over the same time period. So between 0.16% with an FTA with the US and, you know, edging towards uh, 5 to 10% loss of GDP um, from the virus and from, uh, you know, souring of trade relations with the EU, what comes out of the US is a drop uh, in the ocean. So I think what's really important is, um, is not the, the dollars and cents, as you put it, not from, not from the UK perspective, um, you know, definitely uh, nowhere even close. What is important, um, I'd say, are two things. One is um, that is on the regulatory front. So the UK has an interest in promoting a regulatory model, which is different from the regulatory model of the EU. Um, and that can be seen, for instance, in data where um, the UK would like, uh, let's say, a, um, a, a less privacy focused approach to data than the EU has with its uh, GDPR data protection regulation, which is very strict and basically, and in fact, the European Court of Justice uh, just a few weeks ago um, prohibited exports of data from the EU to the US, except in limited circumstances. Um, so, you know, there is a, um, you know, big blocks of, of data processing that are emerging across the world. And the UK wants to separate itself from the EU in that respect. And a, a trade agreement with the US can help the UK establish itself as a player on, uh, you know, the, the, the regulatory scene 
and, and setting new regulatory standards and so on. So that's one point. But again, it's not immediately a dollars and cents point. The other point, which isn't at all, is purely ideological, really. And the, it's important for the UK government to be able to point to FTAs um, as a new FTAs with other countries, including the US, which is a, you know, the UK's biggest trading partner outside of the EU by, by some measure, up to 20%, depending on how you calculate it. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, from a policy, political point of view, it's very important to this government and, and to all of the governments since the Brexit vote uh, to say, well, look, we're leaving the EU, but it doesn't matter because we are going to be signing new agreements with the US, with Australia, with Canada, with New Zealand, with all of these other countries in the world. We're going to be a free buccaneering, free trading nation. And uh, of course, I started off by giving you the dollars and cents from uh, you know, the impact on UK GDP. And it's, it's nowhere near, no one said, I mean, these figures are from the government, right? Um, or from the civil service, uh, anyway. Um, the, these, uh, the, the gains from the FTAs, nobody says are, are going to go anywhere near replacing the shock of um, a, a hard Brexit. So it, it remains, uh, say, a political point. Um, uh, that and I think the regulatory dimension are are strong um, uh, when it comes to the dollars and cents. Yes, it's there, but as so often with FTAs, you know, it doesn't amount to a huge amount. So, Kyle, I'm going to flip it over to you. And, you know, the big complexity in our process has been that our free trade agreements have to um, pass our Congress. Um, and uh, it's been uh, typically over the last decade and a half, a huge struggle to get the votes uh, to pass them. Um, Ambassador Lighthizer did a magnificent job on USMCA through some uh, very clever wheeling and dealing on the labor provisions and on uh, uh, auto rules of origin. Um, but uh, how do you see uh, the congressional approval process going? Do you think there's enough congressional support? And what happens if we uh, flip to a Democratic White House, probably the pollsters are saying the House will stay in Democratic hands. And there's even a chance that the Senate could flip. So you have all three branches being um, Democratic. Uh, right. One complication here being that Typically, the Republicans have provided most of the votes for these things, and uh, you could see them in a very disgruntled and disaffected um, state of mind um, come uh, January 20th. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I don't have I don't have a great answer to it, but uh, but I I think. Uh, the bipartisan consensus on on trade is is I think completely dead, uh, and uh, so I, I think that it could be hard to get to get this through Congress um, before the election. I think for sure, uh, but but we're 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 definitely going to be past that. But I I don't know that whether Congress is controlled by uh republicans or democrats regardless of which house i don't think that matters too much um because i it, it's going to be narrow you know uh you know control in either case and there's quite a few uh members of congress that are you know if not anti-trade but very skeptical of trade very skeptical of globalization and so I think there would just need to be enough goodies in the deal that you can get. Uh, and, and, and as if you've mentioned yourself, it, it may come down to agriculture, that you get enough agriculture, uh, agricultural exports on the line, and you can start to get the senators and uh, Congress people, especially from some of these rural, more agricultural states and districts uh, to do it. I mean, I, I would almost, 
think for sure that whatever deal that they sign is going to go to Congress, Congress is going to ask for changes and they're going to have to go back and renegotiate it. And th that's why the, the Trade Promotion Authority is almost certain to run out, right? Uh, but maybe one thing they could do, and, and they may have kind of done this with USMCA, but I, you know, obviously I'm not privy to the background discussions, is it might make sense to uh, leave a few things out of the agreement with the expectation that Congress will want changes and then, you know, they'll come back together and say, okay, let, let's do those things we talked about anyway, uh, just so we can look like we responded. Um, and I, I could see that happening. Um, but I, I think because it's the UK and it's not uh, a lower wage, low income country where it's easier it's easier to make these arguments. They're not necessarily true that, you know, we're shipping jobs overseas and uh, we're going to be, you know, we're, we're going to set up factories in Mexico or in China or in, uh, in Korea, and that's going to take American jobs away. I, I don't think there's, those arguments may be made. Um, they're not good arguments, I think anyway, uh, but they'll be much less credible and harder to make. I think with the UK, uh, primarily because most of the stuff that's going to be on the line is agriculture. So it might be easier, you know, to get a free trade agreement with the UK right now than it would uh, if the administration went out and, and started negotiating with, um, you know, a, a, another Latin American country or another Asian country. I think that that would bring in a lot of special interest groups that would be opposed to it. And I think it'd be much harder to get through, but um, there's a chance here. So uh, I think the, the I think that's all I have to say about that. Well, I would completely agree with you. I mean, <laughs> having been there at the end of some of these big free trade agreements, it's not about economics or grand strategy or ec no. policy. It's all about counting votes. And, you know, you yeah. need to get beef for Max Bacchus so that um, he'll support the free trade agreement and he chairs the Senate Finance Committee, which will have jurisdiction over this thing. So it exactly. comes down to these um, very nitty gritty um, sort of issues. And as I think you pointed out, the UK agreement right now, at least, is not particularly controversial because uh, the wages uh, match up. So it's not like Mexico yeah. or a free trade agreement with um, Vietnam or Malaysia, where the low wage uh, stuff starts coming into play. I'm going to just close with one question for you and then kick it over to Jill. So uh, the US faces an effective deadline of July 1st, 2021 to um, notify the Congress that this thing is completed and start the uh, congressional approval process. Uh, so it has to get under that wire before its TPA authority expires. Do you uh, think that a deal is possible in that time frame from uh, a US point of view, given the potential for a transition, Kyle? And Lauren, what about for the uh, UK, where we may not see the shape of the uh, uh, Brexit and whether there's going to be a deal or whether there's going to be a hard Brexit until the deadline of December 31st, since that's another huge negotiation and these things typically go down to the wire. Uh, yeah, I, I can, I guess, start first here. I mean, I, I think I've already said this, but I, I think it could be really hard for them to, to get it done uh, within that time frame, uh, and just get an up or down vote on it. And in fact, I, I wouldn't be surprised, depending on who is in charge of Congress after the election, if they deliberately delay voting on it for the sole purpose of, of not of not just giving it an up or down vote. Uh, but I think they could sign a deal. I just don't. I I, I think that they will try to use that as a deadline uh, because the U.S. is somewhat bound by it. But I think at the end of the day. They're going to bring it back. Congress is going to want changes, uh, and, and there'll be some additional renegotiation. Yeah, the only thing they have to do is sign it and notify it before July one, and then, yeah, then Congress can take it up at any time uh, after mm -hmm. that, as long as it's just been properly notified before TPA expires. Lauren, what about the uh, UK? Well, there's a hard deadline of. Um, the 31st of December for 
um, a new agreement with the EU that can't be changed because that's written into um, uh, well the EU treaties. I mean the EU constitution, effectively. Um, there was a possibility of extending the what's now the transitional period for the UK, uh, but that had to be asked for um, before halfway through the year, and um, that wasn't done. That was a point of you know significant controversy in this country because it was you know peak virus time, um, and uh, it was thought that it should be asked for. Uh, you know that there was political cover for it, but. Uh, the government decided not to do that. And so if there isn't an agreement uh, before, I mean, you say down to the wire, yeah, but there does still need to be, you know, there are some processes and ratification processes and so on for this to uh, get going. The aim at the moment is to get an agreement before the middle of October. That's seen as the, you know, best possible deadline. Um, maybe it can be pushed out a little bit further, but certainly, um, uh, you know, we're talking about the next couple of months. Um, and we should know reasonably soon what will happen on the 1st of January. So um, I'm going to flip it over to Jill. Thank you, Warren, and thank you, Kyle and Lauren. This has been a really interesting discussion. I want to steer it back to uncertainty for just a second and ask a question. Sure. We've got a couple audience questions we'll still have time for, too. Um, so, Kyle, it sounds like you think the clock is really going to run out on TPA before we would be able to get anything through here in the U.S. And you, you've referenced a few times other trade agreements in the past, like NAFTA, like Colombia, that have crossed administrations, um, negotiated under one administration, but not passed or signed or entered into force until another one. My question for you, though, is I wonder if in some of those past examples, the uncertainty surrounding um, the pending trade negotiation was not quite as high as it is now. So, of course, we're in a situation where we're in this negotiation because of Brexit. That has necessitated the UK to renegotiate these trading relationships. Um, you know, a lot of US companies have a foothold in the UK as a launching pad into the Europe because we've got similar legal and banking systems. And I wonder, what do you think the stakes are of not getting this done uh, before TPA runs out or, you know, even not getting it done for very quickly after that? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, and I, I think one of the things in, in my, my research on Brexit uh, that, that we found was that the Brexit vote, you know, created a lot of uncertainty for UK firms. And, and there is some evidence that, you know, leading up into this that we, we saw declines in trade that related to like the probability that Brexit would or would not happen. And when we went and looked outside the EU, because the EU has a number of free trade agreements with other countries that would also need to be renegotiated, we found similar effects. So that, that this uncertainty surrounding Brexit was not just between uh, the UK and the rest of Europe, it actually you know, imposed sort of these uncertainty externalities on other countries that were not even part of you know, the discussion, uh, but now they are. And so, so, so I think, yeah, there, because, because Brexit, well, Brexit has happened and now, I mean, I don't know if they'll get it extended again, you never know, but uh, there, there is some pressure because they, they really are going to, you know, leave and, and go into a new arrangement starting on 1231 uh, to get this done. I, I think that does raise the stakes for the UK to have some other agreements in place. Uh, to kind of replace what they've lost. And so, and, and certainly uh, for the United States, I mean, I think that, that that was a loss because a lot of U.S. firms had operations in the U.K. because they could access uh, Europe from the U.K. And um, now they, they may, you know, pull out in the longer run. I mean, these things don't happen that fast, but uh, having an agreement with the UK might, you know, allow some of those business operations, you know, to continue uh, in the medium to long run uh, for US firms that have operations there. Otherwise, they may move them, uh, which would be costly. So I think that there's an interest there. Uh, and I mean, the, the other thing is that uh, the, the tariffs themselves that the United States has on the UK outside of some of these categories we've already mentioned, like agriculture, are, are quite low. The European Union's tariffs on the United States on average are quite low. And so 
what's going on here is not just that we, we want to get the tariff rates down. It's that the businesses, they just don't like doing business with all this brinkmanship going on at the same time. It just doesn't create a good climate uh, to make investments, to hire people, to decide where you're going to have your operations. And uh, so an agreement with the UK, you know, from the US perspective would provide, you know, some level of commitment uh, that, you know, the business environment that they're going to be operating in, the market access that they'll have uh, in the UK is somewhat permanent. I don't think that these trade agreements, in part because of what the Trump administration has been doing, are nearly as credible as they used to be. Uh, and actually, let's not lay it all at the feet of the Trump administration. <laughs> we did have Brexit as well. Uh, and so as soon as you get the idea, you know, in the air that, that you know, these long standing trade agreements are, are not permanent and uh, can ultimately, you can demand renegotiation or you can just leave. Uh, they're not as valuable as they once were, uh, but they still matter. And so, but it'll take time to build up the credibility of the world trade system uh, either you know, with all these bilateral deals or you know, eventually you know, international relations can improve, but I don't know when that's gonna happen. Okay, thank you. And I would just point um, our viewers to your recent paper on um, Brexit uncertainty, where you do go in more into this idea about the credibility of the entire trading system being challenged yeah. um, because of current circumstances. Um, we've got just a few minutes left. I'm gonna combine two audience questions here. Um, Lauren, these are more for you, but Kyle, please weigh in too. Uh, one is, how do you see the UK negotiators landing with respect to imports of grains, oil seeds, and ingredients containing GMOs? And what is the attitude in the UK about regulatory oversight on gene editing traits? And then I also want to mention, we do have a question on the Irish border issue, which we haven't gotten to yet, um, and the internal market bill and where they, that might stand. So Lauren, if you also want to um, briefly address that one as well too. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so on the GMOs, I mean, we touched on this a bit before. Um, it is um, a potentially big issue, but it hasn't been as much as the chlorine chickens yet. So it's, um, it's hard to say. Uh, let's say there's a vocal small minority at the moment, but that could blow out. Um, very hard to say. Uh, be just because it's, you know, you don't need two issues when you've got one big one, right? So I don't know. Um, in terms of um, the Northern Ireland, uh, Ireland border, I mean, um, the big news there was, well, first of all, in the background, the, the, there's a protocol to the UK-EU withdrawal agreement, which is now in force. Uh, the protocol is actually mainly not in force yet, it comes into force at the end of the transition period on the 31st of December. Um, the UK, by the way, has left the EU, so Brexit, formally speaking, has happened. Um, it's not an EU member state anymore. Um, the, um, uh, what that uh, agreement did via um, uh, the protocol was essentially to put a regulatory border in the sea so that Northern Ireland and Ireland are under EU law administered by the UK in Northern Ireland for the most part. Now, there are a few outstanding bits and pieces and um, just recently the government put forward a, a bill called the Internal Market Bill, which was designed to promote integration of the internal market. It did a lot of things actually, but the controversial one is to secure free trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And of course, that's a bit of an issue because as I was just saying, the withdrawal agreement, the Northern Ireland Protocol kind of does the opposite by putting Northern Ireland in regulatory terms, especially in the EU. Um, now, uh, what really got people fired up was that the bill said that um, domestic law prevails over any, in fact, the bill prevails over any other domestic law, making it a constitution, um, and also prevails over the Northern Ireland uh, Protocol, prevails over the withdrawal agreement, prevails over any international law whatsoever. And that is, um, you know, treaty breaking. And that's extremely unusual for a country to do. Uh, so that, aside from the merits of this, what really got people fired up was that there wasn't any attempt to say it's an interpretation of the international agreement or anything like that. It was just flat out treaty breaking. Now, whether that breaks the Good Friday Agreement, I don't think it does. I mean, most people haven't actually read the Good Friday Agreement. It doesn't actually say a great deal. I mean, people should read it. It's a very short agreement. It doesn't say much. It talks about cooperation. That's about it. It doesn't say anything about free trade between Northern Ireland and Ireland. All of that was done by EU law 
about the EU single market since 1992. So the Good Friday Agreement was predicated upon EU law uh, existing. Now, EU law disappears, you've got to somehow find a border somewhere. So the Good Friday Agreement being violated is a complete, uh, in Australia we call it a furphy, which means um, something that is not true. It's just a red herring. Um, now, that doesn't mean that um, not adhering to the currently agreed arrangements in, uh, in Ireland via the withdrawal agreement, you know, there's nothing at stake. There's a lot at stake. Um, I was actually on a government commission looking at this uh, last year. And uh, I've got, uh, you know, I was, I was persuaded by the security people um, uh, who were involved in that, that uh, any sort of border on the island of Ireland is likely to provoke uh, um, uh, sectarian tensions. And um, so from a broader political point of view, um, you know, the government has to be careful not to allow that to happen. That's, of course, what's concerning uh, the pro-Irish uh, people in the United States. I would just say it's a political issue. Um, it's, it's, it's not as simple as saying this violates a Good Friday Agreement because that's you know, virtually impossible to do, frankly, if you read the agreement. Thank you. I think you've just inspired me to read that agreement, which I have not done before, and maybe others too. That is all we have time for today. I'm sorry we didn't get to every single audience question, but I know I'll be um, following this closely to see how this unfolds and what you all are saying about it as we go forward. Um, I want to thank you, Warren, Kyle, Lauren, very much for sharing your time and insights today. And again, a thank you to the CME Group Foundation for its support and to the Yider Institute team for their collaboration, Matt Schaefer, Ed Bellistery, John Began, and JC Toman. Um, and just as a reminder to our audience, our next webinar will be Tuesday, September 29th on the topic of differing approaches that the U.S. takes to trade negotiations, including the recent emphasis on mini deals under this administration. Again, thanks everyone very much for joining and have a great day. Thank you.